Thank you all, and um, thank you, uh, Greg, for that introduction. And uh, let me first begin by thanking all of you for your service to our country. Um, it is obviously uh, much appreciated, and you are wonderful to have chosen uh, to give of your time and your energy. And uh, I thank you, and I thank your families for the support they provide at you. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Senator John Warner, who is just a wonderful uh, member of the United States Senate. I spent eight years in President Clinton's cabinet. I ran the Environmental Protection Agency, and Senator Warner had jurisdiction over various parts of uh, my agency and what I was up to. And while we didn't always agree, we mostly agreed, but he was always a gentleman and very willing to listen. And I thank you for that, and I thank you for your service, uh, both in the military and also in the United States. Senate. Um, as you heard from Greg, I am the Assistant to the President for Energy and Climate Change. And let me just briefly explain to you what that means. Uh, the President has a series of advisors, people who work here in the White House to advise him on issues. Uh, General Jones advises him on national security. Melody Barnes adv advises him on domestic policy. Larry Summers on economic policy. For the first time, this President decided he wanted an advisor who was solely focused on energy and climate change. And so he created a new office, the Office of Energy and Climate Change, and he asked me to come and, and run that. And it has indeed been a uh, tremendous honor. And it's also been a tremendous responsibility because one of the President's important uh, pieces of his agenda, one of the things he thinks is extremely, extremely urgent for this country is a new energy policy, that we have to begin the process of breaking our dependence on foreign oil, that we have an opportunity to create a whole new generation of jobs, a whole new generation of industries around clean energy, that we need to compete in the global clean energy market, and that we need to start the process of putting a cap on the dangerous pollutants that contribute uh, to climate change. Now, when I started uh, this effort, uh, the President and I agreed there were probably three or four agencies, departments in the in the Cabinet that I would be working with, helping to coordinate across and, and, and develop these policies for the President. I think we're now up to ten participants, uh, ten different Cabinet members who think they have something to say, and they do. It's, it's, it's interesting the degree to which when you step back and you really think about comprehensive energy, it cuts across so many agencies. There's the obvious ones. There's the Department of Energy. There's the Environmental Protection Agencies, the Department of Interior. But there's also housing and urban development, because how our cities are planned, how we uh, manage uh, development in our cities inevitably impacts transportation. And we can have a different transportation future if we think about planning our cities than the one we have uh, today. So it's been very exciting to see um, the number of, of agencies that want to bring the tools they have, uh, the resources they have uh, to try and uh, solve our energy problem and create a different future. Uh, now, I know I don't need to tell all of you that climate change is um, really uh, not just a domestic problem. It's not just an environmental problem. It's a national security problem. And I'm sure you're aware of the many studies that have been out there. I saw one just recently. Uh, the Center for New American Security uh, points out that it is a, a threat multiplier, uh, that it is one of the most significant threat multipliers we may have ever seen. Uh, that when you think not just about uh, how we may have to engage, how we've engaged previously, the United States, but when you think about what may happen in terms of instability that gets created because of changes in agricultural production, because of changes in water resources, because of migration uh, of people, because there isn't the opportunity to grow their food to find uh, their water, that that has a multiplier effect when we think about our international uh, security issues. Uh, we were just in a cabinet meeting uh, with the President, and we were talking about the important issues uh, coming up in the next uh, several months. And then we moved on to sort of the bigger pictures, and immediately we got to a discussion about climate change. And again, I think just demonstrating that. And, and it wasn't raised uh, by the domestic agencies. Uh, it was raised by our national security team, I think a further indication of their concern about uh, this issue. 
uh, one of the things that we know is that if we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, it does mean creating a different energy uh, future. Uh, we are obviously very, very dependent in this country on fossil fuels, and fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels, contributes uh, to uh, climate change. In the 1970s and 80s, approximately one-third of America's oil came from foreign sources. Today, that number has grown to nearly 60 percent. But there are things that we can do. We can make our cars more efficient. And in May, the President announced uh, new um, cafe standards, um, mile per gallon standards. Uh, the Congress had given us authority to require that cars be at least 35 miles per gallon by uh, 2020. Uh, we worked with the automotive industry, and they have committed to bring these cars uh, to market by 2016. We also uh, set the first ever greenhouse gas emission standards for cars. So not only will they have to be more fuel efficient, but they'll have to produce less greenhouse gases. That program, when it's fully implemented, it takes us a while to turn over our car fleet in this country, will mean we will use 1.8 billion gallons of oil per year less than we are using today. So that's the first step. The second step is comprehensive energy legislation. And uh, we have been working on that. Uh, the House has passed a bill. It is a good bill. Uh, but now our sights are turned to the Senate, and as Senator Warner can uh, testify to, uh, that's a different challenge than working in the House. Uh, but we are encouraged by the fact that the six committees of jurisdiction um, are starting to do their work, starting to craft their legislation. Uh, the hope is that as those pieces, component parts, come out of the Senate committees, we will then weave them together. So what are those component parts? Uh, first of all, uh, renewable energy. We need to make a significant investment in this country in renewable energy. And the best way to do that is to give our investors, to give our companies a guarantee return on their investment. And how do we do that? Well, we promise them that if they make a wind turbine, if they make a blade, if they develop a solar panel, there's going to be a market to buy that. And we do that by setting a renewable electricity or a renewable portfolio standard. Uh, the House set one. Uh, it's 20 percent by 2020. Uh, the Senate committee uh, has set one at 15 percent. And we will obviously work to make sure that a final bill includes a very clear opportunity for renewables. You pick up the newspaper virtually any day, you can read about what China is doing in renewables. There was a story just yesterday, an agreement with an American company, which is fabulous. We encourage that. We like that. But an agreement uh, for this company to build what will probably be one of the largest solar farms ever built in the world. The demand for these technologies, the demand for our technologies exist around the world. But if we don't have a domestic demand, if we don't have a domestic requirement to build more solar farms, to build more wind farms, the jobs aren't going to get created here because they're going to build the plants where the demand is. And so very important to creating this whole new industry in this not just a domestic industry but a global industry is setting a renewable electricity standard. The next thing we need to do is make sure that we're using our energy as efficiently as possible. We refer to this in our business as the low-hanging fruit. Uh, these are the simple, cost-effective things to do. And whether it's managing our grid better, uh, the way we move our electricity around, we have a lot of leakage, it's sloppy, it's not well organized, people have probably experienced brownouts in various parts of the country, or whether it's uh, making our grid be really smart, which means it interacts with you in your home. If you have the ability to put solar panels on your home and you're generating electricity that you don't need, you should be able to sell that electricity back to the grid. Uh, similarly, large the large box stores, people with lots of you know, flat roof area, they can put solar panels on. They won't need all of that energy. They can sell that energy back. It means making the grid not just function better, but it means making it really smart and really interactive. You know, there's going to come a time when we're all going to have appliances that are a lot smarter than we are. And so your refrigerator is going to know your pattern of opening and closing 
the door. They're going to know that you go. It will know. It will be able to recognize that you open it at 6 and 7 at 8 in the morning, and then you stop opening it, and you don't start opening it again until 6 or 7 at night. And so it will be able to ramp down its operations and then ramp it back up in anticipation, <laughs> and that will be a saving. Some of you may already have these features on your uh, heating and air conditioning systems where they come on and off and you've programmed it in. Uh, all of this is going to get much smarter. My favorite gadget that's coming to all of us is a device that will allow you from anywhere in the world on your laptop to look up what's happening in terms of energy use in your home. And, and for parents of teenagers who maybe have left their teenagers home for uh, a weekend, uh, they'll be able to check in and see if there's some wild party going on because suddenly there's a spike in uh, their electricity use. But one of the things we've learned over the years is if you want individuals to make better choices about energy efficiency, about how you're using energy, you have to give them access to information. And so there's a whole line of technology, simple gadgets being developed that are going to give all of us the ability to make better choices about how much energy we're using and about when we um, use our energy. And then finally, putting a cap on greenhouse gases. Um, we all recognize that, you know, and, and don't take it from me, take it from the foremost scientist of the world, uh, that uh, greenhouse gases are a serious threat. They're a threat to our environment. They're a threat to the health of our citizens. Uh, they're a threat to our agricultural production. And as I said earlier, they're a threat to our national security. And so the first thing we need to do is put a cap on how much greenhouse gases can be in the air. And then we need to begin to work to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to that cap. And what we believe makes the most sense and will give us the most cost-effective ways of reducing our greenhouse gases is to use a market trading mechanism. Uh, when I ran EPA in the 90s, we set up a program uh, to reduce acid rain. Acid rain contributes to the deforestation of our northeastern uh, forests. And we put a cap on how much SO2, which is what causes acid rain, sulfur dioxide, we put a cap on. And then the government auctioned off allowances. And you had to have enough allowances to match your uh, pollution. Um, now, the cap wasn't, it was lower than how much pollution was in the air. So the government only auctioned off this many pollutants, not as much allowances, not as many allowances as there was pollution. And so if I'm a, a polluter, if I'm a smokestack, and my pollution meets this line, the standard that's been set, the cap, then I have enough allowances and I'm done. If I don't meet it, if I'm above it, I have a choice. I can either install technology and get below the line, or I can go into the marketplace and buy some additional allowances from somebody else who's below the line. And so what happened in the acid rain example is that we found really many more cost-effective ways to reduce acid rain than had been anticipated. In the 80s, when the Congress was debating this in the late 80s, the electric utility industry said it's going to cost us $1,000 per ton of reduction. Do you know what happened? It's been about $275 per ton because we evened it out across the market. We got all the environmental benefit, the health benefits we wanted, but we got it in a common sense, cost-effective manner. And we believe we can bring that experience to bear in the case of greenhouse gases. Now, greenhouse gases are much more ubiquitous. There are many more sources. There are many more types of greenhouse gases. It's not just one problem. It's not just carbon. It's six or seven different problems. But nevertheless, this experience in acid rain, uh, we think, uh, can be uh, extremely important in shaping a program that will allow us to begin our uh, to meet our responsibility in reducing greenhouse gases. Um, I think one of the hardest things for society to do for people in appointed office, people in elected office to do, is to agree to start to address a problem before we can fully experience the consequences. And that is the case with climate change. But the problem is, if we wait to really experience the consequences to act, if we wait for sea level rise to occur, it will simply be too late. If we wait to see the agricultural and freshwater disruptions that are going to occur around the world, and in some instances may already be starting, it will be too late. And so what you're doing by coming here and taking out of your busy 
days and giving time to this issue is helping to show people one component of this problem. And you can speak to it in a way that nobody else can. And you will reach members, I believe, in a way that all my dear friends in the environmental community who are working on this don't, all my good friends in the business community who are working on this don't, because you can speak to it from a very, very personal experience. Um, I am a really optimistic person. I do believe that this generation, we're not all the same age, we've got a few generations here, but that all of us working together will make the choices and will put in place the mechanisms for renewable energy, for efficiency, a cap on carbon, so that we don't leave to future generations a problem they can't solve. I think we will figure this out. It will not be without its challenges, but the addition of your voice to this effort is incredibly important, and I thank you and I applaud you for everything you are doing. Thank you. All right, uh, we've had a couple more people come in, so let's try to get uh, you all that have come in recently uh, into some seats. There's uh, a seat down here, there's one in the middle here, another one in the middle there. Let's go ahead and try to fill in so we don't have to have you all stand. I know there's at least four in the back there and a, a number in four or five here. So if you're standing and uh, uncomfortable, now's a good time to reset because we're going to have a, a number of more speakers from here on in. So let's go ahead and get you all in there. Have a seat. That's great. <laughs> Exactly right. Um, there's there's a number more seats over here too. If if uh, folks in the back want to come around, there's at least four or five um, uh, tied in there. Great. Well, next up, uh, we're going to get the chance to hear from uh, a, a couple folks from Operation Free itself. So, uh, Jonathan and Alex, why don't you come up and get us going? Thank you, Greg. Thank you, ma'am, for having us, Senator. My name is Jonathan Powers. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Truman National Security Project, and as an Iraq veteran, I'm also a member of Operation Free and honored to be here uh, with Operation Free. Operation Free is a coalition of national security and veteran organizations that believe that we must address the threat of climate change as a national security risk. We see climate change as a risk and a threat multiplier, and we see our energy posture and our over-reliance on fossil fuels has put our security in others' hands. And we as veterans understand that we must take our security into our own hands. As vets, we came here today to support the administration in its efforts to enact strong climate change legislation this year, and it's to support the U.S. efforts to lead the world in a global response, and believe that America must once again lead by example and establish itself as a country that, by reducing greenhouse gases, by providing clean energy incentives, by freeing ourselves from foreign dependence, and while doing that, grow our economy. So thank you very much. I'll be followed by Alex Cornell DeHu, who is a Marine and also a legislator from the state of Maine. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Alex Cornell DeHu. I represent beautiful Brunswick, Maine in the uh, state legislature, and I'm working with Operation Free. I first began uh, getting more engaged in the issue of national security and climate change when I was deployed with the Marines in 2006 in Fallujah. And we were on this patrol, and we noticed this line of cars that literally spanned for as far as I could see, trucks, um, vehicles, bumper to bumper, about six inches. And finally, we got to the front of it and realized why they were there. They were actually waiting in line for hours and almost days to get diesel and fuel to run their vehicles. And it really struck me how this country was so crippled and dependent on this single source of energy. It began, me, began getting me to think, well, I never wanted to see the United States become even close to being that dependent on a single source of energy. But in reality, um, in a lot of ways, we already are, even uh, at home and abroad in country. For instance, the convoys that we use to supply our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan the majority of what we transport is actually water and oil, which is used to fuel anything from the generators we use to make electricity to actually transporting the oil itself, which is one of the reasons, actually, why the Marine Corps is taking the lead. And they sent a special envoy 
or task force to Afghanistan to evaluate our energy needs there and reduce our energy use in country so we can improve the security for our troops there. When I came home uh, back to the state legislature, we began to work on some legislation that aims to weatherize our, all houses in Maine, as well as create um, the composite industry to build components for windmills in the Brun at the Brunswick Naval Air Station in my district. Um, because America actually has a tremendous renewable energy potential. Off the coast of Maine, for instance, we have the equivalent of 40 nuclear power plants worth of wind energy. And Garrett is going to get into some details about veterans and green jobs. But it is really unfortunate how we send a billion dollars every day overseas when we could be investing that hard-earned American uh, money into the local communities and places where we live in renewable energy. I took, uh, when I joined the Marine Corps, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution and protect our country, whether it be abroad or at home. And I think it is vitally important that we continue to look at the issue and take on the issue of climate change and national security and really make uh, secure and take control of our energy future. So I would like to uh, now introduce uh, Senator John Warner, who really needs no introduction. He's been a champion of this issue, looking at national security and climate change. And so if you would like to come up, sir. Now hear this. I want to start off with now hear this because I'm deeply humbled by the opportunity to come in here and have a few words with you and, and uh, to listen to your thoughts and ideas. I've been in this room many times in my 30 years in the United States Senate and prior to that, five years as Under Secretary, Secretary of the Navy. But I want to first acknowledge how I got here. It was World War II. My father had served in World War I in the trenches. He was a captain, he was a medical officer, and he was in the thick of it and wounded and highly decorated for his bravery in saving so many lives. So I was proud to be raised by a veteran, and when World War II was coming on, I said, Dad, I wanna go, and he said, you wait until we decide you have to go. And in those days, at 17, you need parental consent, so finally, I got consent to allow me to join the Navy. I wanted to be in the Marines, frankly, I say to my predecessor speaker here, but uh, that wasn't to be. My father said he'd been in the Army and never saw a clean sheet in France in 14 months, so <laughs> we weren't going to. So I got in the Navy, as did every other kid on my block. At 17, in the height of World War II, we all joined. There wasn't any doubt about it. We couldn't wait to A, get away from our parents, and B, the village and the school and wherever you lived, and we got in. But I had uh, no great <coughs> distinguished career. I was training. I, fortunately, it was in the electronics and so forth, and spent a lot of time ready and was aboard ship headed for the Pacific, and the bomb dropped, and it was all over. So I, I mention that because I got the GI Bill out of that. I don't think I deserved it, but I got it. And I stand here today having had a marvelous career owing largely to what the military did for me. I mean that. That GI Bill enabled me, my father died incidentally two months after I got out of the Navy. Uh, we were not a family of great wealth, although my mother was able to manage. But that GI Bill got me through uh, the basic engineering school I went to. But in the course of that, when I was 21, didn't need any more parental consent, I joined the Marines at long last. And, uh, right. And I want to tell you, the guys in the Senate and the ladies there used to razz that dickens out of me because I was the only one that had to go to boot camp twice in the history of the Senate, both <laughs> Navy and Marines. But that, I served in the Marines in Korea with the 1st Marine Air Wing as a communications officer. But again, I mention that only because it was a building block in my life. And I got a second GI Bill from modest service over there. And by golly, what? That, that gave me a law degree. So therefore, I have felt a tremendous obligation all my life to repay what has been given to me by Uncle Sam 
and particularly those who, with whom I worked in the military all those many years. I stayed in the reserves, and it's a long story, I enjoyed that. But then I had the opportunity to come to the first of the Navy Department or during Vietnam, and I'll go back to that momentarily, for five years, four months, and three days, then to the United States Senate, had become the second longest serving senator in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I mention that because those 30 years I was on the Armed Services Committee, and three times I was chairman of the committee, but I'm just trying to not impress you, but point out that I worked to do what I could to help you, each of you, when you were in uniform, I presume during that period, most of you, and to work towards the next generation. And the last piece of legislation I did was as follows. Even when I was chairman, the Republicans were in power, I could not get through the modifications, the upgrades that were needed for the current crop of military and a modern GI Bill. And by coincidence, along came Senator Jim Webb. Now, long story, when I was secretary, he was a young captain. He distinguished himself on the field of battle, and the commandant told me one day, I'd like to have him go on your staff. So, wonderful. I took him on my staff. I was very proud of him. He serves as a young captain. And uh, as secretary, you don't see a lot of the young captains, and frankly, the young captains don't want to see the secretary or the <laughs> CNO. So anyway, what goes around comes around. Now this young captain and I are together. I'm the senior senator. He's a junior senator. He's a Democrat. The Democrats have power in the Senate. And together, he was team captain, platoon leader. We got through, I think, the most magnificent GI Bill ever in the history of this country. We really did. Uh, and the, the, he, if were he here today, he would tell you the principal thing that got us there was the impetus given by the many, many veterans organizations and veterans all across America who wrote their congressmen and wrote their senators and called them and said the time has come to provide for this current generation and the future generation. Let's have transferability to give it to the wife or the child if you're not going to use it. Let's bank it if you can't use it right away and use it later. Anyway. We got it in place. So why do I bring that up? It relates to why you're here. And at the age of almost 83, and having been associated with the military since, let's say, December 1944, I know the credibility that each of you individually and collectively bring to any task you undertake. And I've studied all the polls on this climate change and energy business and actually was on the committee in the Senate and was co-sponsor of the Lieberman Warner Bill, which was the only climate change energy bill that got out of committee, got to the floor, and then somebody pulled, as we say in the Navy, the Seacocks, and our ship went down. The administration decided they did not want the Bush administration to deal with this issue in the closing year of their watch. But when President Obama came in, he reinvigorated the enthusiasm in this subject, both of energy policy and climate policy, and the two of them are linked together closely to our overall national security. So today I'm lecturing across the country on this subject. I won't give you the full breadth of it now. But what you bring is what is vitally needed. I don't mean to disparage in any way the environmentalists who've carried this torch for so many years on these issues. But frankly, as we begin to infuse the fact that at the point of the spear, and you and I know what that means, at the point of the spear, reacting to the orders of the commander in chief of the United States, and that's the president, the point of the spear is a uniform military. And he determines when you go forward from the shores of this great nation of ours out to perform a mission. And one of the last things I did as chairman of the committee was to put in legislation to require the Secretary of Defense to begin to study potential roles and missions occasioned by the very thing that the distinguished assistant to the president, Carol Browner, just said. 
that can happen in the world as a consequence of erratic climactic changes or erratic energy shortages, erratic water shortages. All of those things can precipitate what every one of us in this room was taught to deal with, conflict. And that means this president and future presidents are probably going to have to dispatch our forces because of the consequences of climactic energy, water, migration, all of the things that, uh, that distinguished Carol Brown, whom I've known for years, said. But bear in mind, you, you have to say to yourself, why am I here? You're here because you bring credibility. The American people today, all the polls show this, have greater trust and confidence and respect in the uniformed people almost in any other entity in our entire nation. Now, I've seen the reverse. When I came out in 1946, came home with my little discharge button on my lapel, took off my old sailor suit, stuffed it in a drawer, and went out. People just treated veterans. You couldn't buy beer. You couldn't You do anything. We went to college. They took care of us. It was extraordinary, the welcome attitude, the gratitude of this nation towards the veterans in World War II. Then we trotted off to Korea. And when I came home from that, I'll never forget, I was in a discharge center out in California. And some of the guys said, hey, stuff your uniform in a bag. Go home in your civvies, because you don't want to be in that uniform. They don't even know where you've been. That was called the Forgotten War. And sure enough, that was true. But so I put my civvies on, went by train in those days, crossed the United States, and came back to Virginia. And then Vietnam had hit an all-time low. I was in the Pentagon working with you, your forebears in the, in the uniform, and by golly, out on the streets was absolute antagonism towards the individual in uniform. But that's gone 180 degrees, and today it's comparable to what I witnessed in the closing day, year of World War II and when the veterans came home. So that's why we need you. I say we, the America, need you to go out and be spokesman on this issue. Learn as much as you can about it, be it energy or climate change and the linkage to national security. Formulate your own views. You're not going to agree with everything that's said on this subject, but formulate your own views and encourage the people where you live and organizations you're associated with to pick up and take an interest in this. Because as Carol Briner said, this is going to be the most significant impact on our future economy of anything. Maybe health care is going to be parallel to it, but this is absolutely co-equal. In the magnitude of change that's got to be brought about, if we don't step up our technology, if we don't acknowledge we've got to meet this challenge, then believe me, nations like China and India are going to eat our lunch, folks and we're going to be out there by ourselves. So I welcome you. I thank you for the credibility you bring to this debate. I salute you, and thank you for your service, brother service person. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, my name is Rob Diamond. Uh, I first want to say, Senator, it's an immeasurable honor for me to follow you. Uh, I'm a former Naval officer, served seven years on active duty, graduate of the Naval Academy. So to stand here uh, uh, and follow a former sailor and former Secretary of the Navy, it's an honor, sir. Uh, to the other admirals and generals in the crowd, distinguished guests, uh, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Uh, I stand before you today as a foot soldier, uh, a fellow veteran in Operation Free, one of one of many of us that have gathered here in Washington, D.C. today to carry the message back to our cities and towns across the country about why energy security and climate change is a national security issue. Uh, I served in Iraq in 2004. Uh, we took our guided missile destroyer right off the coast of Iraq to guard two oil terminals that sat there right off the southern coast, uh, where 90, per 90 plus percent of the oil that flowed out of Iraq uh, flowed through these two terminals onto tankers at sea and off to countries around the world distributing that, uh, that energy around the world. My job, I was a weapons officer. I was a lieutenant on that ship. I was tasked with planning the mission to defense of those terminals. Uh, I did that for 60 straight days, 
spent then two weeks turning that assignment over to a New Zealand uh, ship. We had an international coalition. Uh, two weeks turn, turned that over. Uh, we departed south to, to do some more boarding operations in the, uh, in the northern Arabian Gulf. Uh, 72 hours after we turned that, that mission over, those oil terminals were attacked in the suicide mission. Four Coast Guardsmen and two US, two, US, two U.S. service sailors, two Navy sailors, apologize, were killed in that attack, guarding an oil infrastructure system that was delivering oil around the world. Each and every one of you in this room has a similar story, whether it was guarding convoys, delivering fuel, uh, jet fuel, uh, gas for your tanks, your Bradleys, whatever it was. Each and every one of you has a story like that about how you signed up to serve and defend our country and have been fighting in wars and in, in, in almost two generations now, if you, if you look back in, in, uh, in history here with the 70s and 80s and 90s and into our generation here, fighting wars in regions of the world where at the root of the, at the, root of the mission was an energy security mission. As the Senator and as, and as Secretary Browner mentioned, uh, the torch that's been carried by the environmental community has only gone so far. Uh, we have a new story to tell about the energy security piece of this argument and why as soldiers in Iraq and sailors in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, that, that going forward, this, this is a two-pronged approach. This is not just about uh, climate change. This is not just about the effects of pollution in communities. This is about a strategic weakness for our country. And as men and women who had signed up to defend and fight for our country, that's the problem that we see. We bring new credibility. We bring new voices to this issue. Uh, one of the things I spend my time doing is organizing veterans and military outreach for the Democratic Party. I cannot tell you the power that you have when you knock on a door or pick up a phone or talk to a reporter and say, I'm a veteran and I believe X, Y, or Z. People listen to you. People instantly give you credibility. It's a you are the most powerful messenger we can have out there. So I, I urge you to go back to your states, your cities, your towns, get on the radio, be writing op-eds, find your fellow veterans, talk to them about energy security, talk to them about climate change, Talk to them about why they're the most credible messengers we have so we can help this administration get this bill passed this year and we can be a generation that gets things done. Th I thank you for your time and again thank you, uh, Senator, for, for your remarks. And I'm going to be introducing uh, Admiral Lee Gunn, who's with the American Security Project. It's also uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, another Navy officer following me as well. Admiral. Thanks, Rob. I'm also proud to have been a member as a lieutenant commander of the Senator's Navy. Um, and I, in a sense, represent many of the, the uh, Vietnam War veteran uh, era people, in, and I'm among the more senior folks that you'll, you'll have talked to you about this. But uh, to the degree that I'm able, I'd like to say that, that on behalf of those who served long in the Navy under different circumstances, long in the military under different <coughs> circumstances from those that you experienced, uh, who served more recently in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, that we are truly grateful for what you're doing and the time you're spending and for the energy and effort and credibility you're bringing to this task. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm honored to be in your presence. It's terrific to be on the, on the stage with my colleagues today. I spent 35 years in uniform. Um, I entered the Navy during the Vietnam War and retired well after the Berlin Wall fell. I helped evacuate UN forces from Somalia, weathered enormous storms at sea, oversaw many billions of dollars of the Navy budget, and I have seen threats materialize from crowds that moments before uh, looked like peaceful civilians. Yet of all the threats I've witnessed throughout my career, I've never seen a threat as complex and for which we are as little prepared as the one we're here to talk about today. It is the threat that I believe is still vastly misunderstood and underappreciated, but a threat to which we must respond, and the threat is climate change. It's what you're going to go and talk in this most credible way about to the American people. I know that there remain some who are not convinced by the climate change uh, argument, and I am. You're going to confront those people as well. Many still do not believe that humans are contributing in important ways to the warming of the globe. I believe that human activity is an important factor, and I sense by your presence here that you do as well. But leaving aside that aspect of the debate, permit me to offer this observation. Threats and risks never present themselves with 100% certainty. 
By the time they achieve that level, as General Gordon Sullivan, the former Army Chief of Staff, has observed, something bad will have happened on the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, something bad is happening already in our climate. We as a nation can debate how quickly this threat will manifest itself, but I believe I can guarantee this. The risks to American security, great as they are, continue to grow if we don't act with urgency. Our country is about to engage in a public debate over what to do about climate change, and you are extraordinarily important in that debate. This debate will have lasting impacts on the environment, on our economy, on other aspects of our security, and on the future we leave to our children and grandchildren. To be clear, addressing climate change is not simply about saving polar bears or preserving the beauty of mountain vistas. Climate change is a threat to our national security and taking it head on is about protecting our way of life. Earlier today, our American Security Project released its uh, Climate Security Index. I think metrics are important and I believe that you have received copies of it. If you haven't, we can make sure that you do. In it, you will see the story of how climate, energy, and security are all interwoven. You will see how melting glaciers, particularly in the Himalayas, will jeopardize fresh water for over a, mil a billion people and may increase the risk of conflict in that volatile nuclear-armed corner of the world. In our report, you will see how globing, global warming will increase the risk of desertification, particularly in vulnerable regions of North Africa which is already home to a number of extremist groups that contribute to international terrorism and provide so-called foreign fighters that worsen conflicts in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in South Asia, and you faced many of them. But you don't have to take it from just of those, those of us who've talked today. There is an increasing understanding across the national security community that climate change is a threat to American security. We saw it in the National Intelligence Estimate prepared on climate change last year. We saw it in the final National Defense Strategy of the Bush Administration, which listed climate change as a key shaper of national security in the coming years. And we see it in the growing chorus of voices who believe that meeting the climate change challenge isn't just green environmentalism, it's red, white, and blue patriotism. The story of climate change and its interplay with Americans, America's dependence on foreign oil is one that must be told, and you have a critical role to play in telling it. We're soldiering on with that mission at the American Security Project, and we are delighted to join you in that effort and with Operation Free as well. You have a unique story to tell. Thank you for adding your voice to the coming debate. There's too much at stake for Americans to remain silent. And with that, I'd like to pass the baton to uh, Garrett uh, Reppenhagen. Uh, Veterans Green Jobs, who operates in Colorado, and thank you very much again for your service. My name is Garrett Reppenhagen. My father was a Vietnam vet. I'm the grandchild of World War II veterans. I served as a sniper in the 1st Infantry Division in Iraq around Bakuba in 2005. I didn't truly understand what my service meant until I came home and I was part of a Veterans Day parade in my hometown in Colorado Springs. A young mother came up to me with two children and she shaked my hand and generally said, thank you for your service. And when I looked into her eye, I really understood that she meant that. It's that sense of service that brought me here today. It brought me to Veterans Green Jobs, where I'm training a workforce, where we're putting boots on the ground in the towns and cities of America to weatherize homes, to bring renewable energy to every corner of this nation. It's that sense of service that brings you here today. We know that veterans have amazing qualities, a strong work ethic, solid values, ab ability to work under pressure, leadership skills, but it's that sense of service that drives us. It brings us to conferences like these, to Washington, D.C., to tackle legislation on the Hill that'll bring clean energy to this country, to get us into, the, into communities and really help our fellow Americans become independent themselves, save some money on their energy bill, and save this nation wasted energy, and really unite this country un under a new mission. And that's what we're doing at Veterans Green Jobs. It's not a reintegration tool. It's an effort to retool veterans to start on a new mission. And that mission is to green America. 
We want to take control over our future. We want to secure national security. I know the professionals that I served with in Iraq care deeply about our communities, our economy, and our environment. And we're not going to rest until we know that we're doing the best we can do for America. And we continue that service. So you can do this country a great service by passing legislation that helps clean energy and help me continue my mission with Veterans Green Jobs and put veterans out into the field to help our fellow Americans. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, y'all. It's wonderful to hear from you all about it today. Um, we have a couple of speakers from the administration who we uh, brought together to um, get a chance to talk about a little bit about what we're already doing. You heard from Carol Browner today about some of the ongoing work in the Recovery Act and, and, and various components of the uh, energy legislation um, within the administration itself uh, through existing programs. We're also trying to tackle a lot of these same challenges. So I want to invite a couple of them to come up and speak today. First, um, the Assistant Secretary of Energy and the Administrator for the National Nuclear Security Administration, Tom D'Agostino. Tom? Well, thanks very much. Uh, frankly, I didn't know what to expect when I came here. Uh, this came up fairly quickly, and I'm blown away by the amount of energy in the room for the people here and the passion that they have. Uh, first of all, like the other speakers before me, I want to thank you for your service. You know what it's like to serve your country. You've done it. You've been out there. You have a tremendous passion for it. It's part of who you are. And as the speakers before me have said, it's that specific skill, that, those capabilities, it's what you bring to the table that's going to make a difference in this whole debate and discussion that faces the nation. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Department of Energy and to deal with one of the most important issues that we face in our country. Under President Obama and Secretary Chu's leadership, we're working to pass historic energy legislation that will create a generation of clean energy jobs here in America reduce our independence or dependence on foreign oil, and prevent the worst effects of climate change, including the national security challenges that we just heard about. I'm a Navy veteran as well. Seems to be Navy Day <laughs> at any rate. Navy Marine Corps fighting team, I'd like to say. And I've spent nine years on active duty serving in the submarine force as a submarine officer, and about 20 years in the reserves and a variety of assignments, including for working for Admiral Gunn here. And uh, last week, the President asked me to stay in my position as Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration so we can continue that important work of maintaining our nuclear weapons stockpile, taking care of that deterrent, of doing our nonproliferation work around the world, and of making sure that the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program continues on in the important work that it has in powering our aircraft carriers and our submarines. But I'd like to take a minute, sir, and thank you very much, Senator Warner, for what you've done for me. Decades of uh, work for your country. I served under your Navy as well, sir. And specifically, uh, during my first Senate confirmation hearing, Senator Warner chaired the Armed Services Committee, and he shepherded me through the process, a very involved process, of getting ultimately into one of these positions, working uh, for the President of the United States, uh, for both uh, uh, President Bush and President Obama. So I owe my, uh, my, my position here, I owe directly to you, and I want to thank you for that in front of this great group. We've all worked national security issues long enough to know that the threats we face are all interconnected. Protecting our national security also means protecting our economic security. And passing a strong energy and climate bill is one of the most important steps that we can take to secure our economic prosperity and leave a healthier planet for future generations. At the Department of Energy, we're working to make clean energy profitable. That will drive investments in wind and solar power and promote the next generation of biofuels. We're working to spark American innovation in fuel-efficient automobiles and the development of advanced batteries for electric vehicles. We will offer incentives to restart our nuclear power industry and encourage utilities to invest in carbon capture and storage from coal-fired plants. Under Secretary Chu's leadership, the department is also working to reinvigorate the great American research and innovation machine. That's the machine that got this country to where it is today, and it's the machine that's going to take us out into the future and, frankly, help the world with global problems that we're going to be facing. You wouldn't think of it, but the organization I run, 
The National Nuclear Security Administration is providing the tools that are playing a critical role in addressing global ch climate change. For example, we've built some of the world's most powerful and fastest computers. Using, and we, we're actually using these computers to tackle some of these issues. These computers were built to ensure that we can maintain a safe, secure, and reliable nuclear weapons stockpile without underground testing. But they also are being used to model the very complex phenomena that happen as, these co as, as all of our molecules interact and cause the problems that we believe are happening today in front of us. We want to get ahead of that problem. We want to simulate what's going to happen out in the future so we can anticipate and work our energy policies correctly to avoid getting into a situation where we can't recover from. Let me give you a couple of examples. At Los Alamos, our climate, ocean, and sea mo ice modeling project is using advanced supercomputing to model changes in seawater levels and water temperatures. At Sandia National Laboratories, our research have developed a new wind turbine blade design that promises to be more efficient than current designs and could significantly reduce the cost of energy of wind turbines at low wind speed sites. At Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, our researchers are mapping the impact of climate change on agriculture. And earlier this year, we completed the construction of the National Ignition Facility, or we call it the NIF. Not only is the NIF the world's largest, most powerful laser, but it could hold the key to clean energy out in the future, and that's fusion. NIF was built to improve our understanding of the impact of aging on the nuclear weapons stockpile by recreating fusion reactions that occur in a nuclear explosion. But it's also bringing us closer to understanding exactly what it takes to harness this, ener to harness this potential source of energy out into the future. I'm not saying it's going to happen next year. What I'm saying is, is you've got to start the research engine that's going to take us, that this country is going to be able to uh, need, and frankly, the world is going to need 50 years out into the future. So these are just some of the examples of our nation's investment in nuclear security over the last 60 years that are actually addressing problems we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago when we first designed these programs. More importantly, it's an example of what is possible if we as Americans truly invest in the challenges that we have before us. We have the tools. We know what we need to do. We know that the status quo on energy is unsustainable. Now all we need is the will to act. We need to pass this energy bill. So let me conclude by thanking all of you here for being leaders in this fight on climate change, leaders in representing the great American servicemen and women that have protected this country for many decades previously, many centuries previously to you, and will continue to do so after. You have the credibility to take this message up to the Hill and take it back to your communities and really make a change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Really, really appreciate it. Um, next up, we're going to have Mike Parker, who's the uh, Deputy Director for Operations on the uh, Veterans Employment and Training Services over at the Department of Labor. Mike? Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm breaking tradition. Senator, it's more than an honor to, uh, to be here with, with you and share the stage with you. I'm retired Army, 30, 30 years. Cool. Okay. So I, I knew there had to be some Army guys out there somewhere. But uh, on behalf of Secretary uh, of Labor, uh, Hilton Solis, and Assistant Secretary of Veterans Employment and Training Service uh, as part of the Department of Labor, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your service. Uh, we have over 2,200 to 3,000 uh, 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 workers out in, the, out in the field that work real hard to help you uh, help veterans find employment, and that is our primary focus, and that is to assist veterans in finding employment. We also work with uh, homeless veterans, uh, we work with uh, incarcerated veterans, and we also work with spouses in helping them find employment also, which is very, very Im important. Uh, we're all very, very proud of you. But what I'd like to do to, this afternoon is talk very briefly about a program that we have to let you know what we are doing as, as on our part to help with the green energy uh, situation. Uh, we, we have a program which is called our Veterans Workforce Investment Program, which is a program that is mandated by Congress. Congress provides funds to us, and what we do, we go out and we uh, find, uh, we, we find in, uh, uh, companies and, and all that uh, want to uh, 
hire veterans. And as, as doing that, uh, the VWIP, we provide grants to them. And the grants have two objectives. The first objective is to provide service to assist in reintegrating eligible veterans into meaningful employment within the labor force. And second, to stimulate the development of effective service delivery systems that will address the complex employability problems facing veterans. And that's why we have those folks in the field to assist you with your uh, skills de development and all. Now, these VWIP grants that we, uh, that, that we have, uh, these grants are primarily focused on, on uh, individuals, uh, it's, let's put it like this, it's a, it's a highly competitive uh, uh, grant uh, system in where companies, they come and they compete uh, for these uh, for the, for these funds, and uh, what we did last year, we had a uh, total of 17 uh, grants that we we gave out to individuals all over the United States. And if you're interested in in where they're located, uh, you can see me after this, and I'll be more than glad to tell you that. But uh, we prov they got grants in the amount of anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 dollars, and that funding is to assist you in finding employment and especially in the green energy field. Now, what are some of the jobs that they, uh, that they said that they are going to, uh, to pursue in the green energy field? Some of those jobs are indoor, outdoor, air quality, energy conservation, uh, composite materials, biofuels, lead and asbestos removal. So basically what we have, we have people that are out there talking to employers about trying to, about hiring you to do these types of jobs. And the funding that we're providing to these, with these grants uh, also include the training uh, of veterans to be able to, to do these types of jobs. So uh, the, the job that, uh, that the gentleman from uh, Colorado is, is doing is a, is a great job, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit after, uh, afterwards about that. Uh, but those are the types of, of things that, that, that we are doing uh, within the Department of Labor uh, under under vets to uh, assist with this green jobs energy uh, energy program, um, the grantees uh, also submit the number of jobs applicants that they plan on assisting. For example, one grantee said that I will assist up to 100 130 people. We hold their feet to the fire on that, and they report back to us quarterly and let us know how many people that they are, they are working on. These grants are good for, for a year. And as I said before, these are, these are uh, grants uh, that are provided uh, to them, uh, highly competitive. When I say highly competitive, we have a, a team that we bring in from the field to sit down and, and judge these, uh, these applications. But I do want to say that uh, as, a, uh, as a veteran, I feel very, very proud to uh, be able to stand here and talk to you uh, today uh, to thank you for your service. And just knowing that what we do within the Department of Labor, Veterans Employment and Training Service adds a lot to what it is that, uh, that you have done for us. I don't think we can ever repay you for your service and things that you have done. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, good luck to you in your future. Thank you. I know you are all, all are on a tight schedule today, but Mike's also offered to stick around afterwards if folks have any questions and want to come ask about particular programs or grantees. Um, finally, I wanted to invite up Joe Riojas. Joe is the Assistant Secretary for Operations, Security, and Preparedness at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Joe? Well, thank you very much, Senator and other distinguished guests here in the room. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I, too, am a veteran, uh, served over 30 years and served in five different uh, of our Army divisions uh, as a red leg primarily and proud of that and want to thank you for your service here in the room. I do represent the great men and women of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. We are a very large organization. I joined the team in May, not really having an appreciation for how large the breadth or depth of the work that we do to serve others. Our employee force is over 292,000. We serve over 8 million veterans, and we will see more than 1 million veterans in our medical centers this week alone. 
We have a footprint of over 1,600 different facilities to include 153 medical centers to 128 cemeteries. Our footprint is very large. Our customer base is very large. I say that because Secretary Shinseki <laughs> has challenged all of us to reduce our energy consumption, to be good stewards of resources so that we can be a model for others to follow within our government structure, and we're very proud of taking this on. I applaud this gathering. I applaud the debate. I would offer that we need to have a bias towards action. Last night I was with a group of individuals and we were having a conversation before the president's speech and I had the pleasure of listening to a lady who has done some remarkable work with organizations uh, dealing with nuclear affairs in the past. And she accomplished a lot and we were going over some of her successes and she said, yes, I was a member of a do tank. And I had not heard that term before, perhaps some of you have. And this is not meant to be disrespectful of those in the room who might be part of think tanks. You provide a very important role for our government. But do tanks, she had the budget, she had the ability to make things happen, is what we need to do if we're going to make a substantial difference in the area of energy conservation and controlling our climate. What we do is important. How we do it is also vitally important. When we start out our lives, we begin completely dependent upon others to feed us, shelter us, clothe us, take care of us, keep us alive. Some will say that we are energy dependent now on foreign governments. As we mature, those of us in the room who are parents, we like to see our young men, our young women, our sons and our daughters become independent. And we are proud when that moment comes and uh, we are, you know, we have this sense of accomplishment. And that's good. And that's good for us to approach this independently as organizations. But if we want to do graduate level work, if we want to really have an impact, not only as a nation, but on the global front, that, that calls for interdependent action. Coming together, universities, government organizations, non-government organizations, federal level, local level, state level, all important to come together with industry and other entities in a very interdependent manner, and that's how we'll gain strength as a nation and really have a significant impact, not only for ourselves, for, for our global community as well. Again, congratulations for being here and thank you for your service. All right, thanks everyone. I just wanted to say one more time, thank you all for coming. It's been a real pleasure to get to know you, get to hear some of the stories. Um, we uh, look forward to hearing the results of the rest of your work today. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important work. I think you've heard from uh, the administration's perspective of how important it, us, how important it is to us and, and uh, to thinking about both the future on national security, on, on energy, on climate change, and we look forward to continuing to hear back from you about how that work goes. Um, again, please stay in touch. As Carol said, we want to make sure this is a, uh, a start of a conversation. It's a start of an engagement. I know that you all are uh, looking at different ways you can contribute back home, and we want to make sure that, uh, that you know that the, the White House is working with you to help make, make sure that gets done as well. Uh, Senator Warner, thanks again for being here with us. And for all the speakers, thanks for the time to come and uh, talk with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, y'all.